The next section of the introductory lecture is going to focus on two slides. Um, this will be uh, the shortest in duration of these segments, uh, but I want to spend some time on each of these elements because they have uh, applications in real-world settings as you're wrestling through cost containment issues on campus. Uh, in the readings, we're not going to spend much time on how institutions are adjusting their operating structures to reduce the cost of instruction. Um, so these two slides, until we have the chance to be together in Nashville, uh, provide a little bit of an opportunity to explore what other institutions are doing. And then if this is an area of interest, we can converse uh, via email or in person in Nashville uh, with respect to particulars. So as institutions, community colleges, universities, private institutions, public institutions are examining cost, are examining uh, their response to increased pressures from elected officials to hold down tuition and fees, what are the levers that they can pull to help minimize the cost side of the equation? The revenue side of the equation, as we uh, witnessed in the prior section of this lecture, uh, really comes from two primary sources, state appropriations and tuition and fees. So in an era of stagnant or declining state appropriations, coupled with increased pressure from public sectors to hold down tuition, or in a promise era, I think there'll be growing calls on the community colleges to minimize tuition and fees so that promise can remain within its financial projections. What are things that you can pull as administrators, as faculty members, as staff, to help balance the revenue and expenditure side of this equation. So as you can see on the slide, there are three thematic elements here, and there'll be a couple thematic elements on the next slide. But within administrations, there are items that many institutions and many systems implement in order to realize administrative savings. First is strategic procurement. Rather than Northeast State or Motlow State or Walter State buying paper independently through the collective purchasing power of the Board of Regents, they're able to purchase paper at a lower price. The same can be said for Banner. The same can be said for anything that comes through a shared services contract. Um, our state has implemented SciQuest, as have a number of states across the nation, uh, which bring together the collective purchasing power of institutions to help savings from a strategic procurement perspective. The next is shared services in the back office functions of your institutions. Some of you may have looked to a third party provider for the call center for your financial aid office, or you may have outsourced food service to Sodexo, Aramark, or Chartwells. You may look to enterprise to run your institution's fleet rather than maintaining a portfolio of vehicles um, that require then staff to support their maintenance. All of those are examples of efforts that institutions have utilized to recognize cost savings from a back office perspective. Another is energy. Um, you see institutions utilizing energy uh, savings contracts to make investments in their fiscal infrastructure, their steam plants, et cetera, to bond that out and then to repay those bonds uh, based upon shared expectations and energy savings. Uh, you're seeing that with lighting improvements, moving from traditional uh, inflorescent lighting to LED lighting, um, brighter, more safety, uh, respective elements associated with lighting on campus, but cost savings associated with that that are then paid out in long-term bonds. And then personnel costs. Institution is examining staffing levels uh, in the extent to which they may be over and understaffed and then right-sizing their institutions from a faculty and staff perspective. The next is through strategic investment. Uh, how do we retrofit mechanical equipment? Um, I referenced earlier uh, investments in uh, fiscal infrastructure, moving from coal to natural gas is something that many universities, ours included, have done from a retrofitting perspective. Um, transfer savings from student services functions, thereby maximizing uh, investments in retention. So rather than spending in an athletic area, for example, to take those savings, reinvest them in student affairs, uh, in advising services, et cetera, with the hope that those investments will maximize retention rates, which will then generate additional tuition revenue and benefit the institution from a funding formula perspective. Uh, the purchase of IT equipment to upgrade efficiency and system productivity. 
D2L is a wonderful example of cost savings from an IT perspective, um, but you're seeing institutions moving to uh, the increased use of apps and um, IT elements that streamline the process aspect of an institution, allowing one person to do the work of four as you bring systems into an electronic portfolio. Uh, and then other institutions looking at uh, faculty and staff pay plans. Um, this will be a critical issue with the implementation of the FSLA standards in 2016. Uh, how do we ensure that we are complying with federal regulations to ensure that we are not recognizing subsequent downstream increases in the production function of institutions because of our staffing portfolios? And then there are efficiencies on the academic side. Uh, improvements in the cost effection of developmental education. We've seen this in Tennessee with the implementation of the sales program um, and the integration of developmental education into uh, traditional course uh, experiences rather than standalone R&D programs uh, and the faculty to support those R&D programs as we had in the 70s and 80s and the 90s. Many institutions the Board of Regents has led this to examine low-cost programs. THEC has been involved in this as well, uh, but to uh, bring together those programs that traditionally are low producing, uh, thereby realizing savings on the faculty side or on the staff side. Um, you see institutions looking to increase the credits that are produced off campus, online, um, or through prior learning assessments, uh, thereby diminishing the need for full-time tenure track faculty in some respects, um, also pushing out to institutions uh, in an off-campus uh, perspective a lower cost means of production than you have on the traditional campus setting. Um, the enhancement of cohort and alternative delivery models. Then curriculum redesign. Uh, Tristan Denley at the Board of Regents is doing a lot of work around the redesign of programs that uh, prevent transition through the pipeline for undergraduate students. And then last but not least, institutions looking at space utilization. We will touch on space utilization and some of these elements as we discuss RCM budgets later in the semester, responsibility-centered management within an RCM frame. Uh, subsidiary uh, elements within a university would pay for space. So rather than the university covering the cost for space across campus, Departments would pay for the space that they use within the institution's infrastructure uh, with the thought and the realization from a research perspective that departments are then much wiser stewards of their resources when they're having to pay for space rather than space being paid for by the institution as a whole. What can we do to maximize revenues? Um, from an administrative perspective, institutions are looking back at chargeback uh, elements across campus. So rather than the provision of services for free, print shop, photographic services, IT services, et cetera, many institutions are charging their departments for the provision of such services, just as if IT, print shop, et cetera, was a third party entity. Um, they're increasing fundraising expectations for deans, presidents, department heads, et cetera, with the recognition that external funds from a philanthropic perspective can help balance declines in state appropriation um, and support the operations of the institution. You're seeing many institutions develop profit models for their off-campus centers, that those off-campus centers become cost centers. They stand on their own. They receive no cross-subsidization from the university, uh, thereby realizing efficiencies in the production function. Uh, you're seeing public-private partnerships that maximize land resources. So rather than a university building a residence hall on its own, you'd work with a third-party provider who would construct the capital, uh, they would incur the debt service payments, and then an institution would guarantee occupancy in that residence hall. So that pays off the note, and then 30 years later, that facility transfers to the university. Um, so the use of market-driven um, public-private partnerships to meet the capital infrastructure needs of the academy. And then you're seeing budgeting at the campus level linked to planning goals. Um, the next element from a revenue perspective is enrollment growth. Um, if you're unable to increase tuition and fees, a way to maximize revenue is to grow your enrollment. So reaching out to new markets, adjusting financial aid programs to maximize the yield on those institutional investments. If you know that you're going to have 100 students with 29 ACT scores come to your institution and you're providing them with $5,000 scholarships, would that 100 remain 100 if you reduce the scholarship to 3,000, took the net savings and invested those in need-based programs which drive enrollment across the institution? Partnering with alumni to help market and recruit the institution in new areas, to develop online programs, 
to coordinate marketing campaigns across universities. Uh, many of you, as you logged into this course on D2L, as you looked at the course syllabus, or if you see my lapel pin, you notice that the university has one consistent mark, the E with the state of Tennessee in the middle. When I arrived as president four and a half years ago, we had 132 logos across campus. So it was difficult for the institution to convey its message in the marketplace when there were a multitude of images that represented the university. It was hard to tell what was ETSU and what wasn't ETSU. So by moving to one consistent visual identity, it makes it easier for someone to say, that's East Tennessee State University, I wanna learn more about it. Uh, many institutions are looking at fee specification. So online fees, differential fees for programs, uh, and manner and mechanisms through which cost of instruction can be recognized from the fee side of the equation, given the fact that the funding formula in its current iteration in the state of Tennessee does not recognize the differential production cost for high cost programs. And then finally, moving adult students through short term courses. Uh, many universities across the country start semesters every week. Some have multiple starts for the semester throughout the fall and the spring. So the recognition that in order for institutions to meet the needs of non-traditional students, uh, we have to adjust the pace uh, and tone of the academic calendar. Um, that pace and tone uh, being geared to meet the needs of students rather than the traditional start in the fall, start in the spring. And then finally, uh, from an academic perspective, uh, revenue enhancement with new programs. New programs with market potential, RN to BSN programs that are online moving to larger class sizes and space maximization rather than teaching an intro to American government course, which I taught as an undergrad, and I also taught at Nashville State Tech with 30 students, putting me in front of 300 students, providing support from a uh, pedagogical perspective to help uh, work with students, i.e. a smaller scale version of the MOOCs, uh, but thereby lowering the production cost for the delivery uh, of that instructional methodology. Um, focusing on a completement agenda, and then finally the Ria Saluda model, I referenced that earlier with multiple starts through the semester. I had the chance a number of years ago to visit Ria Saluda Community College in Phoenix. I uh, was fascinated by the structure of their academic year. They began a new semester every Monday. A faculty member would be responsible for teaching a set number of students throughout a fall semester. So as a faculty member, it would be my responsibility to teach a constant load of 40 students all fall. Some may start at the beginning of the term, they'd complete the course mid-cycle. The students move at their own pace with the recognition that they need to complete the course by the fall, but they could take the course in six weeks, four weeks, two weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. As students come and go, I would have additional students join my course. So I would be teaching 40 students at different points in time across that curriculum but I would bear a constant load of 40 students for that class. And then if I had a load of five classes for the semester, that would be replicated for the other courses that I taught in my department. Ria Saluda realized significant and pronounced exponential growth because they brought products to market a public institution in a manner that meet the needs of non-traditional students. So as you reflect upon calls that you receive from members of the General Assembly, members of the Board of Regents, your president, uh, chief academic officers, chief fiscal officer, and others to examine ways to increase productivity, diminish cost, increase revenues, maximize resources. The items that I've walked through here in this portion of the lecture give a very quick glimpse of some of the things that are being articulated across the nation. If you're interested in learning more about this, the Delta Cost pro Project, uh, Jane Wellman and her staff have done a great deal of work on the production and uh, revenue side of the equation, as well as those items that drive cost. Uh, Patrick Kelly uh, at the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems has also done a lot of work in this area with his colleague, Dennis Jones. Uh, and there's a rich stream of resource available on the Lumina website that allows you to research case studies of institutions uh, in which they have implemented efforts to reduce costs and maximize revenues. So from Lumina to NCHEMS to the Delta Cost Project, three resources that if you Google and spend some time on their website will allow you to uh, dive with greater granularity into the topics covered in this brief portion uh, of the lecture. I'll be back uh, to talk a little bit about environmental challenges that we face in the academic domain. So I'll pause and look forward to joining you here uh, in the next section of the course. Thanks.